Um, all right, so it's my pleasure. Uh, first of all, welcome everybody to the uh, UTIG uh, seminar series for this Friday. Um, this is also um, a, a stop on the Ocean Discovery Lecture Series associated with uh, the International Ocean Discovery Program. Uh, that, as Reed Shearer, our speaker today, is one of the distinguished uh, speakers on that uh, seminar series. Um, and uh, Reed is um, uh, he's a distinguished research professor who's a micropaleontologist and a biostratigrapher from Northern uh, Illinois University. Um, we were just talking about where, where his origins are, so he did his bachelor's at a place called Southampton College that no longer exists and is now taken over as part of uh, Stony Brook on Long Island, um, and his PhD at Ohio State where he actually overlapped with uh, Don Blankenship. Um, uh, and then um, uh, certainly Gail Christensen and I was originally his host, um, knew him um, from all of our overlap uh, in the world of the International Ocean Discovery Program science evaluation panel and the various other sort of service panels that, that make the, the world of scientific ocean drilling kind of uh, click and move forward and be very much a community-based ground up uh, procedure. But then Reed and I also interact um, in the world of just Antarctic uh, geology, Antarctic climate, and uh, paleoclimate in particular. Um, and so that's, I'm sure, what we'll be hearing about today. Um, his uh, talk's title is Inferring West Antarctic Ice Sheet History from Diatoms, Offshore, Nearshore, Down Core, and Beneath uh, the Ice Sheet. So with that, Reed, take it away. Okay, let me swap. Okay, that should be right. Uh, yeah. No, uh, no, the other way around, I think. That, that's right. That's better? Yep. Okay. That's that's perfect. Always hard to tell when you got two screens. Yes. Well, thanks for <laughs> thanks for having me. This is actually, although the the uh, lecture series runs through the academic year, this is actually my first one since I was at uh, at sea on two different ships, uh, the better part of of uh, the fall semester. And then, of course, it would have been fun to, to, to visit, but we know what the modern world is like. And so this will work just fine. Glad to, glad to see you all. Thanks for coming. Um, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a, a retrospective of, uh, of the questions that have been nagging me since, uh, since I was starting out as a grad student, in fact, be, before I was a grad student. Um, trying to figure out um, Antarctic ice sheet history. And when I got into this, this game, it was, it was all a very sort of um, academic exercise as to, as to the stability of things like the West Antarctic ice sheet. And, and as we know, just through the, through the course of my career, it's, it's become very much more real than we could have even imagined at the, at the time. So what really, um, my first introduction to, uh, to this concept of, uh, of Antarctic ice sheet history was as, a, as an undergrad at Southampton um, uh, in a marine geology class. And this paper, this benchmark paper by Jim Kennett came out that was doing a, a sort of a overview of uh, Antarctic ice sheet history built mostly from the materials that were recovered from the deep sea drilling project, Antarctic legs, 1972 to 74, leg 28, 29, and 35, and, and really the, the, the development of the oxygen isotope record. Um, in this particular paper, his discussion, Kenneth's discussion of West Antarctica, um, sort of implied that, it, that the main part of the Antarctic ice sheet formed in the Miocene, but the West Antarctic ice sheet formed at the end of the Miocene. Um, and uh, in his book, uh, Marine Geology textbook that came out a couple of years later, he was more explicit that it formed in the late, latest Miocene uh, and it implied that it had been there ever since. And, and he also had said that many times in, uh, in talks, but in his papers, he wasn't necessarily as explicit as, as that. So that was the, the framework from which uh, uh, I initially viewed Antarctic ice sheet history. But then this paper came out just a couple of months later. This play, paper by John Mercer 
blew my mind because first of all, it's got a very attention grabbing title, the West Antarctic ice sheet and the CO2 greenhouse effect, a threat of disaster. Now, some of you gray hairs like myself might even remember that back at this time, people were talking about global cooling in a coming ice age, not about carbon dioxide and a greenhouse effect and global warming. Although in scientific circles, they knew that, but in the public, they didn't necessarily. So the thing that amazed me about this paper, first of all, was it was the first nature paper that I read and understood. So that was, that was a good start. But the th I always assign my students to read this paper because it is so brilliantly written. Why is my, my mouse isn't working? I'll just click. Okay, so here's the, here's the abstract. Three sentences, each sentence completely independent of the other, and it ties together to paint an amazing picture. It's sort of sort of like a haiku, the way the way it, with a, with the economy of words you can you can say a lot. So if the global consumption of fossil fuels continues to grow at its present rate, atmospheric CO two content will double in about fifty years. And so, okay, well, we're coming on fifty year. 50-year uh, anniversary of this paper before long, and, and we haven't quite doubled, but we're getting pretty close. Climatic models suggest that the resultant greenhouse warming effect will be greatly magnified at high latitudes, and this is absolutely true. We certainly know this to be true now, although it was speculative at the time. Um, in the third sentence, the computed temperature rise at latitude 80 degrees south could start rapid deglaciation of West Antarctica leading to a five meter rise in sea level. Well, and we know that surface melt is less of an issue in Antarctica than um, ocean driven melt coming underneath ice shelves and to the grounding zone. And, you know, just the, the ice uh, that's, that's displacing water in West Antarctica is not quite five meters by itself. Uh, and it's also not equally distributed around the world, but Anyway, considering this paper was, was published in, in 1978, it's pretty prophetic. And that's why it's such a uh, um, you know, influential paper. And I, was, uh, I started at Ohio State and John was, was still around. Unfortunately, he, he became, became ill in my first year there, but he's just a fascinating guy. I remember seeing this paper with such a sort of, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, attention grabbing title, I thought he has to be sort of a, you know, brash and, and bombastic sort. And it turns out he was, you know, painfully shy, but totally brilliant fellow. And so this, this started bringing my, my view of how ice behaves a little bit different from what Kenneth had taught us um, based on the, on the um, uh, deep ocean record that there's more to ice than what can be gleaned from the oxygen isotope record. I seem to remember from my high school algebra that if you have um, uh, one equation with more than one unknowns, then it cannot be solved unequivocally. So in other words, with uh, um, looking at an oxygen isotope record, it'll tell you about ice volume, but it won't tell you where. So the final sentence in this paper is worth reading. If the CO2 greenhouse effect is magnified at high latitudes as now seems likely, deglaciation of West Antarctica would probably be the first disastrous result of continued fossil fuel consumption. Okay, well, it depends on how you wanna define a disastrous result. We're seeing all kinds of disastrous results happening around the world, but, but they're sort of local. This would be the first of the global uh, singular global effects should it happen. And I never imagined as I started thinking about these questions that, that we'd, we'd see the kind of changes that have uh, already played out um, in the last couple of decades. So the, the central hypothesis of Mercer's paper is that um, Sea levels were higher during the last interglacial, about 120,000 years ago. These are, of course, more recent papers than the ones he was citing. Uh, but nevertheless, we know that there was more water in the ocean during the last interglacial period. And so he made the case that 
uh, that West Antarctica probably disappeared during the last interglacial and that it provides the physical basis for the idea of West Antarctica going away and then coming back. And we all are very familiar with the, the fact that, that you know, Antarctica is the, the large um, ice sheet of East Antarctica, mostly above sea level, though not entirely, and West Antarctica, which is the archipelago ice filled to the bed, uh, which is displacing the water and therefore more, more uh, uh, unstable than East Antarctica because so much of it is touching the ocean. And so there's, uh, you know, the, the basic configuration without the ice. You're all familiar with that. Okay, there've been a lot of efforts to look into this question. And, uh, you know, just, just citing a, a recent paper by Peter Clark, modeling paper that, uh, that is pointing to, uh, to uh, what Mercer suggested that West Antarctica um, went out and that it was, um, largely coming from the Amundsen Sea embayment. And of course, uh, many of you are very well aware of the, uh, the, the Thwaites Glacier initiative that's going on right now. We've got a lot of operations on the ice and offshore, although a lot of the, the, the ships are having, having trouble getting in this year because of ice conditions. But we know that this is an area that's seen um, dramatically accelerating ice retreat, um, especially over the last couple of decades. So, uh, so major things happening in in this sector. So it really gets back to back to the question of um, uh, what would it take for John Mercer's threat of disaster to play out. Um, here's another paper from 2020 by Garberall um, suggesting that, let me start that, oh, it doesn't wanna, doesn't like to play a video if you have it on, uh, if you have it on, on laser pointer mode for some reason. Okay, so here from their, their model, you can see the retreat that's happening later from here, starting in the, in the Ross and the Waddell side. And, and a big point of this paper is that uh, the hysteresis within the system would then retard regrowth. So if, if there's a temperature increase of, of two degrees, that could be enough to trigger the collapse, but it would take more of a reduction of, than two degrees to build it back up again. And so they have the, the ominous conclusion that if the Paris Agreement is not met, Antarctica's long-term sea level contributions will dramatically increase and exceed that of all other sources. So. Scary stuff. So I started uh, at Ohio State as a grad student and I really wanted to test this hypothesis. It struck me as, as something that could be tested. Did the West Antarctic ice sheet disappear during the last interglacial? Um, so today I'm gonna show you a couple of ways we've, we've tried to address this question and then some broader questions as well based on um, based on using um, diatoms. So first, since I know this is an institute of geophysics, uh, most of you are not are not paleontologists. So I just I just want to want to uh, take a defensive posture for a moment and uh, and and point out that micropaleontology, although it's a rather low tech and old school science that uh, dates back to the origin of uh, of microscopes. Um, reached its peak in terms of numbers of micropaleontologists in the 70s, most of them going into the oil industry and a lot of them in academia and every university was producing micropaleontologists. And that's been, been uh, reducing in numbers greatly since that time. But I hope I can convince you that there's a whole lot more we can do with them than just figure out what the, uh, what the age is. And not that that's not an important component, because as you, as many of you know, if you go out on the Joides Resolution or associated with any of these uh, uh, deep sea sediment uh, recovery uh, campaigns, um, mission critical is figuring out what the age is. And biostratigraphy, as oldest, old and, and low tech 
a uh, an approach it is it works really really well we've had a very very well established at this point and this is the reason why the paleontologists are the very very first people to get their hands on the mud as soon as it comes up on deck because we're the ones who call what the uh, what the age is which is going to be guiding many of the decisions with regard to how much further you're going to be drilling so and lots of other things you can do besides figuring out what the age of the sediment is based on the based on the fossils. You can learn a lot about changing environments. So, um, put put very simply, in the Southern Ocean, we can track uh, changes in the position of the polar front by looking at the assemblages of diatoms. So here's you know a characteristic diatom of the sea ice zone, of the permanent open ocean zone, and of the subantarctic zone. And so these these things change over time, and we can track that quite quite effectively. But when it comes to uh, West Antarctic ice sheet history, yeah, we can track climate change and ocean change, but is it really telling us what's going on in West Antarctica? Um, the closer you get to the ice sheet, the better off you are in terms of addressing these questions rather than having your, your signal attenuated by the global ocean, we can perhaps get, get more of a direct tie. So I was out on, on uh, Expedition 379 in the Amundsen Sea in early 2019. Um, and uh, we had five primary drill sites, most of them on the continental shelf. We also had 24 alternate sites. And as Sean would, would tell you, anyone who has been associated, and, and Gail, and anyone else who's been associated with the Science Evaluation Panel or the Dreddy's Resolution um, Facilities Board, they're always screaming for more alternate sites because you never know what's going to happen. So uh, you need as, as many contingencies as you can. And we certainly needed that on expedition on this expedition because ultimately we're only, because of sea ice conditions and icebergs and other challenges, we were only ultimately able to drill two of our sites. They were none of our primary sites. In fact, the two sites we were able to drill were the alternate alternates. Okay, which are way far out from the from the the continent and the shelf itself on the edge of the uh, uh, of the the continental rise. Um, nevertheless, we got some really really great results from these two sites. And so here, of course, we had varying abundance of diatoms, varying abundance of ice rafted um, debris. So I'm going to just just cite two examples about that that uh, my students have. Uh, done recently that, that have come from this from this site. One of the things that we try to do is get a paleo temperature record. Remember, if you uh, if you accept that two degrees um, atmospheric temperature, which would which would correspond to surface water temperatures around there, um, if that's a threshold for West Antarctica to to go out that we need to have a good paleo temperature record for these times to, to know whether, whether the models are, are correct or not. And in these sites, we had very few 4M, so we don't have an isotope record and a lot of the other proxies are, uh, are, are lagging indicators or, or unavailable. But diatoms are genetically programmed to behave in a certain way under certain conditions. And uh, a scientist uh, originally at the Alfred Wegener Institute by the name of Michael Kloster had mapped out um, and quantified morphometric variation among species. So here's the most abundant diatom species of the Southern Ocean, Fragilariopsis kerguelensis. And if you just look at them, you see there's a variance in size, but there's also a more subtle variance in shape. See, this one's a little pointier and this one's a little rounder. It turns out that these two morphotypes are directly linked with the water temperatures under which they're growing. So what, what um, Kloster did was he developed a, uh, 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 a morphometric analytic package that will take images and categorize them. And then from that, you can calculate the temperature as calibrated by surface water and surface sediment calibrations of the variance between these two um, morphotypes, the warmer morphotype 
and the cooler morphotype. You see, there's not that much overlap in terms of these two uh, end member shapes. So they can be quite effective as a, as a paleo temperature indicator. So one of my one of my students, Joe Mastro, finished his master's in 2020, um, started the ball rolling um, by by doing these analyses. I know you can't read all of this, but these are just some of his histograms that are that were used to establish temperature for the last um, 630,000 years from this uh, this site. And what he what he found was the this part of the record, um, MIS 13 to 15 was quite warm, including 14 never got all that all that cool uh, itself as an, as a as a as a glacial period. So this is an extended period of relative warmth um, with temperatures approaching and, and exceeding five degrees, so significantly warmer than today. MIS 11 uh, got warmer than today, again past that that threshold. So suggesting that conditions were such that you could have a collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet during that time. But, but stage five surprised us in that it did not show conditions to be much warmer. They were still less than one degree C, so reaching um, around uh, 0.75 degrees C. So, so um, theoretically not warm enough to uh, permit a collapse, at least from this sector. And Joe Ruggiero is a current master student of mine, has, has delved into to 5e in much more detail. And he's basically confirmed what Joe Mastro had originally said from his analyses, and he's adding a whole lot more data. So the, the bottom line is, it doesn't look like 5e was quite as warm as some of the earlier ones. It was also rather short-lived. So this paper is suggesting that, uh, that I already showed is su suggesting a, um, a, a, at least a partial collapse during the last interglacial, um, largely coming from the Amundsen Sea component, but we don't necessarily see the evidence that supports it, uh, from, at least from the simple perspective of paleo temperatures. Okay, another question that had been out for a long time is how, if you have a collapse of the ice sheet and you have all of these icebergs coming out, how is that impacting ocean conditions? So diatoms need a lot of nutrients. And so they are the, the limiting factor are, are mostly terrestrially derived nutrients like iron. And it had been suggested that, that icebergs can compel higher productivity of diatoms, but it hadn't really been demonstrated um, uh, until Heather Furlong was defending her master's and will be starting on her PhD. She's defending in, in about two weeks. Um, she took a very, very deep dive into an event like, like this, which is um, a Pliocene uh, interglacial period capped by, a, by pulses of IRD and then a transition into the uh, uh, the terrigenous sediment machine that was cranking out um, downslope transport during the glacials. And so here's the interval that she focused on, uh, the time period during which um, we went from this warm world and just starting into the cold world and the, and the buildup of more ice in the Northern hemisphere. But really the, the, this period started with this major glaciation called the M2. This is the time period before that. And throughout this, this is, these are two sections uh, going from the laminated glacial into interglacial conditions that were persistent for a while. Down here, they were largely um, um, bioturbated, lots of diatoms, but it wasn't until here where you went and just occasional little IRD in there. And you really didn't get the big pulses of IRD until much later in this time period, which, uh, which she figures is, uh, and it seems, seems quite reasonable that it's, uh, it's the MG5 uh, interglacial. And so this is likely a collapse of the ice sheet. Now, how did she delve into this? Uh, we, we developed a, a technique for um, for continuous recovery 
of material we call a v channel we have this little um little guide I actually happen to have it right here um, um and so we cut out these little v channels put them in these trays and that way she was able to analyze uh in the in the sem all of these transitions and basically what she was looking for was coordination uh, or correspondence of IRD and uh, increased diatom production. So she, of course she looked at the diatom assemblages and biogenic silica and a whole bunch of other things, but, but visually what she found is, is really quite clear that when you have ice rafting, you have dramatically increased diatom production and accumulation, which of course is also sequestering carbon. So it may be that when you get great armadas of icebergs coming out, you are also helping to draw conditions back down into, uh, into a cooler world by um, changing oceanographic conditions associated with the icebergs, but also through increased primary productivity and increased sequestration of carbon. So that's all great, you know, that we can, we can finally, finally draw a clear uh, a connection between the two, but it really still leaves us with a nagging question. We wanna know if this is the West Antarctic ice sheet collapse event, we wanna know how quickly it was. How long did it take to evacuate all the ice from the interior? And figuring out whether this represents you know, a thousand years or 500 years or less than that or more than that is extremely difficult. That's a, that's a challenge we're still grappling with. But we can clearly see that as, um, as the, the ice is being evacuated, carrying with it these materials, it's affecting the, uh, the environment as well. Okay, so the offshore records provide us with a really nice evidence for climate change and for ice rafting production, but um, unequivocally tying those to waste collapse uh, is, is still a little bit unclear. Certainly we've got very strong evidence for MIS 11 and 13 to 15 and, and earlier ones like marine isotope stage 31 and, uh, and in the Pliocene, but we're still left with the nagging question that, that uh, led me to 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 uh, try to test Mercer's, hy Mercer's hypothesis back in the day. So let's take a different approach to this. The closer you drill to the ice sheet, the more likely you can reliably connect the two. And many of you are familiar with the drilling program around 15 years ago, the Andrill program, which was a wildly successful program, setting up a, a drill rig on the on the ice shelf. Um, and drilling uh, into, into this, uh, this basin just adjacent to, to Ross Island, uh, wildly successful in that we got a 1,284 meter core with 97% recovery. And a good portion of it was um, diatomite. Um, and the diatomite had an obliquity paste uh, uh, change between open ocean conditions, as illustrated here in yellow, and more glacial advanced conditions is illustrated by the, by the green diamect. So it was about 50% was, uh, was diatomite. So we had this amazing record, fantastic detail, but it's far from a complete record because it's rife with unconformities, especially I would argue in the, in the Pleistocene. See up here in the Pleistocene part, we've got a lot of glacial diamects and few little mudstones, but we don't really have diatomites, but we also don't have any uh, uh, reason to believe that this is a continuous record. Um, so I think we're, we're missing some stuff here. So it's really not getting to the Pleistocene questions, although we learned a whole lot about how the ice sheet behaved during the Pliocene. So what I argued to my PhD advisor was that the best way to get at this question is to get a look at sediments that are deep within the interior underneath the, the ice. And here is the, 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 the basic um, concept. When you, when you evacuate ice from here, you end up with a seaway, okay? This seaway would have been very rich in nutrients 
would have been highly productive to diatoms. So they would have then sank to the, to, to the bed. But unlike um, doing offshore drilling, where you have nice cores that are, that are giving you a, a good time series, uh, the glaciers then readvance, erode, mix, transport, degrade, generally turn it into a garbage dump. So then you have to identify the fossils that are all mixed together in a few um, bits of mud, bits of till. So what they do is you don't get the time series that you get from offshore records, but you do get proximal evidence of events. And so um, um, fortunately for me as a, as, as a grad student, the uh, um, Barclay Cam and Herm Herman Engelhart had, uh, had ramped up their, um, uh, their drilling program into the ice streams where they were interested in, in profiles of the ice, but it was uh, you know, uh, influenced in part by, by, by Richard Alley and others, uh, the idea that the sediments underneath the ice are critically important to uh, stability and behavior of these ice streams. So we need to get underneath to see them. And so I made the pitch to Barkley that the microfossils could be an important part of that. So this was the simple uh, hot water drill system that, that Herman Engelhart built uh, at the time. And sure enough, yeah, we have, we have my favorite little guys in there, including a bunch that are Pleistocene. So this provided the first um, direct evidence that the West Antarctic ice sheet had disappeared during the Pleistocene and there was an open seaway through. But there were also older fossils as well. There's actually a chunk of nanofossil ooze of, uh, of late Eocene age. There, are, I found one piece of a foram. Chris, this is for you. It's one piece of a, of a, of a biserial chalogwimelina or whatever it is. And then a bunch of other things of different ages. So the Pleistocene diatoms were not abundant, but they were definitely there. So that provided the first direct evidence that it disappeared. But the biostratigraphic age of this is not as well constrained as we would like. So it still left the question of whether it was uh, stage five or not. And in the papers that, that followed this, um, I argued that stage 11 was and these are these are old. This is you know 1991 when I was you know still a grad student and and uh, uh, 1998 in science where we added some beryllium 10 measurements and other things. Um, uh, we still couldn't say for sure whether it was stage 11 or stage five, uh, so the question still remained. Um, more recently, we returned to this area for drilling into subglacial Lake Willens and to the grounding line at the Willens Ice Stream with the Wizard Project. Many of you are familiar with that. And so here's a compilation of, of this region and all of the samples that had been recovered, starting with the sediment cores recovered from the Ross Ice Shelf Project in the late 70s, a sample collected um, uh, for Bin Shadler's, uh, Bob Bin Shadler's program quite by accident at Crary Ice Rise. They were not intending to go through the ice, they just were going to put thermistor cables in, but they ran into the bottom and, and it came with goop stuck, to, stuck on it. And so I was able to get a hand, hand uh, uh, get my hands on that. And then samples recovered from uh, the Willens ice stream, the CAM, and the Bin Shadler ice cream. And then with the Wizard Project, Subglacial Lake Willens and the Willens grounding zone. And I'll point out there's a new program that's been funded now, uh, S Waste 2C, which is sensitivity of the West Antarctic ice sheet to two degrees C. So this is a, this is a New Zealand and US and a, probably some other partners uh, program that's, uh, that's ramping up now where they'll be setting up a drill rig in, in stagnant ice uh, at the, the lower reaches of the CAM ice stream, which is currently stalled and by um, stagnant ice at the Crary ice rise. So I'm looking forward to seeing what they recover in over the next um, several years. So the, in addition to the Pleistocene, which remains a question, there was also uh, older diatoms and my, my former PhD student who's out on the Joides resolution right now, um, uh, was able to test a, a tectonic model for the uh, development of the West Antarctic Rift System that was published by Guy Paxman and others in, in 2018. 
because with these samples, we can look and see what the ages are. He came up with two scenarios of a minimum uh, 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 sort of gr uh, ground cover um, for the Eocene and, uh, and a maximum. So this, is, this would be anything that's on the green side would be exposed land during the Eocene. And this would have, uh, and, and so, so what, he, what he found was that most of this area would have been subarially exposed. Yet Jason found Eocene and other age diatoms and other fossils, um, um, dinoflagellates as well, um, as well as a lot of terrigenous material, uh, freshwater diatoms, as well as pollen and spores. So it's, it's adding, adding uh, color and pointing out that the, the Paxman model, even the even the, the minimum reconstruction probably isn't enough, at least for during parts of the Eocene, this was all still, un, still a marine system. So this provided a ground truthing of, of his model. Okay, and there was one other really, really surprising thing that, that came out of this. We first um, uh, drilled at the grounding zone here, uh, there was a narrow cavity that was a little embayment, about 10 meters water depth under about uh, more than 700 meters of ice. And there was a whole community of organisms living there. Uh, amphipods, a couple of species of fish, jellyfish, um, no benthic community because this was just underneath the ice and the ice was melting and dropping a lot of sediments. So this is a very fresh surface here, but lots of things living there and lots of geochemical tracers that are suggesting that there was even more exchange with the open ocean than we expected, including surface water exchange, because we had um, uh, bomb produced iodine-129 in the water column. So it's suggesting that it's not just circumpolar deep water that's making it all the way back there, but surface waters are mixing and making it all the way back into this narrow cavity. But that wasn't the thing that really surprised me. We decided to, to check the... Um, the radiocarbon in this. Now, when I was here in 1991, I remember thinking about what analyses can we do? Okay, what analyses can we, can we do besides the diatoms and whatever geochemistry? And I remember thinking, well, we should radiocarbon date it. And I thought, well, what a ridiculous waste of money because the youngest it could possibly be would be the last interglacial. And that would be too old for radiocarbon. So it was, a, it was a pointless exercise to send any of this off for radiocarbon. Because I made the assumption, like everyone else, that the current position of the grounding line, which is around here, is the minimum extent since the last glacial maximum. But all of a sudden, we're finding radiocarbon in all of these samples, old samples and new samples, indicating that the grounding line had retreated beyond where it is now. So during the Holocene, the grounding line retreated beyond these, these sampling areas, and then it re-advanced re to where we are now. Now, I gave a talk on this at Lamont in, in um, uh, 2016, and I had not met um, Johnny Kingslake before, but I remember during my talk, there's a, there's a young guy in the back of the room jumping out of his seat. He could barely contain himself and wait till I finished to say, to, to announce, I have the same behavior. He was looking at radar profiles from these pinning points here, and he had, he had data that he interpreted as a retreat and a readvance since the last glacial maximum in this area too. So it was like, holy cow, I was presenting um, uh, you know, controversial data. I was expecting a lot of pushback. Instead, we came to the conclusion that yes, this indeed happened, and it was and it was probably a, uh, an ice sheet wide result. So we, we, we joined up with, uh, with Torsten Albrecht of, the, of, of PIC, the Potsdam uh, Climate Center, uh, who had run a, um, uh, a recent PISM model for the same time period and had found similar behavior. So, oops, back. It's behaving very weird, sorry. There we go. So here's, here's that, uh, that model from the last glacial maximum years up here. So this is, the, this is the, the reconstruction of the last glacial maximum. And then it pulls back in the Ross and the Waddell side. 
and it pulls back beyond the current grounding line and then it readvances to about where we are now. So the model does a pretty good job there. But the thing to notice is that nothing much changed in this model here. The, the retreat and readvance behavior was here. The retreat here from the last glacial maximum did not go much beyond where it is now. Now that, that was interesting, uh, the fact that the, that the grounding line had retreated significantly here and here, but the whole thing didn't accelerate to collapse like we had led, been led to be, believe previously that <clears throat> if the grounding line retreats a little bit, then the, the retrograde slope will, will trigger this, this collapse event. Didn't seem to, to happen here. Um, and more recently, don't have time to, to, to talk about this, but uh, um, uh, Sarah Newhouse and, and uh, Slavik Tlachik had done some, some uh, mixing models suggesting the, the climatic source and, and probable age of that radiocarbon. But anyway, uh, moving on um, to, to, the, to the big conclusion here, um, <clears throat> the retreat and readvanced behavior, if you believe all of our data and this model, happened in the Ross and the Waddell seaside, but there wasn't a significant change um, in the Amundsen seaside where the Thwaites Glacier and the Pine Island Glacier are. So this is why we suggested that this was the, the linchpin for West Antarctic collapse. In order to get West Antarctic collapse, you need to pull that, pull that pin. And of course, Terry Hughes back in 1981 from University of Maine uh, called this sector the weak underbelly of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Now, the changes that we're seeing in Thwaites right now are really troubling. Uh, we're seeing um, really dramatic melt and retreat um, at the grounding zone now. So the no past event is a perfect analog for what we have now. And especially now we live in such a no analog world that, that perhaps what was going on during stage 5e and what's going on now are really not that comparable. So just to, just to run through a couple of conclusions and wrap things up here, uh, these distal ocean records provide us a nice time series for changes that take place in the ocean, and we can infer icy changes from them. But to, to really get proof or unequivocal evidence of West Antarctic ice sheet collapse and West Antarctic seaways, you really need the sediments that are underneath the ice. And we have models that are conflicting. We all know the, the, the old adages about all models being wrong and some being useful. Um, there's still a whole lot more we need to learn. Um, they're getting better and better all the time and we need to keep doing that. And so back ultimately to the threat of disaster, um, it doesn't look like he was right in all cases, but he was certainly right in the main, that this is something we really have to be concerned with, and we really need to be making changes if we want to delay the worst, um, still, still avoiding um, specific questions about how long it's going to take or, or when, what the, the, when the threshold uh, will be reached if it already has been reached, because that gets back to point number three, that we really need more, uh, more study. So there's plenty of stuff for grad students to be working on for their careers. But also for those who want to keep doing ocean drilling, the Joides resolution is reaching the end of her working life. And so we really need a new drill ship and there's real progress being made toward that. Uh, and this is a bit of a plea to take, to take the, uh, the US Ocean Science um, Ocean Discovery uh, uh, survey on what your needs are for the rest of your career. Uh, a lot of us have been doing this for a long time now, and it's, uh, you know, a, a lot of the, the younger folks need to be uh, really getting involved with, with writing proposals, proposal pressure is important, um, and also helping us design the next, the next ship and frankly, lobbying Congress to make sure that the, that the funding comes through 
so we can have a new a new drill ship and and uh, ocean drilling well into the future. So with that, I want to I want to thank you um, for for listening. Um, I don't really have time, but I'll just want to give you a give you a tiny little bit of a teaser about the expedition that I had um, uh, last summer, where we uh, unlike uh, unlike uh, expedition three. Seven nine, where we only were able to drill two out of our 25 sites. Here we blasted through all of our primary sites and did a bunch of our of our others as well, with incredible results. Looking at the interaction of um, of large large igneous province and and PETM, uh, the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum Hyperthermal event, um, where we have really strong evidence now for the venting of CO2 triggered by, by uh, volcanic sills going through old sediments. And, the, and this, we've got, this is an interval that took, uh, that spanned about 140,000 years. We've got 80 meters of it here. And a lot of it is pure diatomite uh, where we even have uh, laminae that are seasonally preserved that look like, look like, um, uh, sediment traps, really incredible stuff we got on that leg. So with that, I'm going to stop and, uh, and, and say thank you and, and entertain any, any questions that you might have. Excellent. Thanks very much, Reed. Um, we will, anybody who is interested in, in uh, asking a question, just uh, either post it in the chat and I'll, I'll read it out um, or go ahead and just raise your hand and we'll, we'll call on folks. All right, Gail. Yeah, I'll start out with a, a, a broader question. So diatoms, why are diatoms um, in the polar regions and not global? Well, a couple of, couple of reasons. First of all, um, they don't have to fight for carbonate like, uh, like, na uh, like calcareous nanofossils and, um, and uh, uh, forams do. So they they like they like the cold water. Cold water tends to have higher um, dissolved silica in it, which they need as well. Um, but what they mostly like, not necessarily the temperature, <clears throat> is the nutrients. They're most limited by nutrients. So they're in the upwelling zones, in the circum uh, uh, you know the circumpolar um, upwelling zones, coastal upwelling zones, in the equatorial uh, upwelling zones of the the Pacific. You have diatoms accumulating there, so it's really all about all about um, uh, whether there are sufficient nutrients for them to uh, to develop. They also uh, the the oceans are everywhere undersaturated with respect to silica, so diatoms are living everywhere in surface waters, but they aren't necessarily accumulating on the seafloor unless the production of them is high enough that they can make it down to the seafloor where the where the poor waters would be buffered enough to pre prevent further dissolution. Most of the diatoms just get recycled in the water column and never preserve as fossils. Great, other questions? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll ask one while we're waiting. Um, I'm really interested in the different response that's going into say Amundsen Sea versus, you know, the, the Wendell and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts as to whether there's a glacial dynamic, you know, whether it's in part not just driven by the ocean access, but any kind of glacial dynamic feedbacks associated with, you know, sediments and and surface melt and ice that might be contributing to that difference? Yeah, as I as I said early on, you know, I, I went into this field initially with a with a simple minded view of how ice behaved. And, and that's why I started, you know, I'm I, I'm probably. Uh, the world's only um, uh, paleontologist, glaciologist, <laughs> not the fields that usually go together. Um, but but I was really interested in, in how they worked. And, and so the idea of these, these ice streams uh, being able to flow because not just there being water as the lubricant underneath, but there's, there's a, a, a mixing of, of sediments and the deforming till beneath um, so they'll do a whole bunch of other things with with diatom fragmentation associated with uh, with with uh, um, glacial interaction with the bed. 
but yeah, it's a very, very different, different setting in the sort of the, the um, low profile seafloor of the, the Ross side where the, where the grounding line can advance and retreat over a very broad area, as opposed to the, the Amundsen seaside where the, the Thwaites are much narrower and also probably less, uh, less available sediment underneath. It's all been stripped, stripped out. So you have more ice in contact with hard rock as opposed to having having a, a soft cushion of sediments where they can flow more easily, um, so yeah, the 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 geomorphic differences between the different sectors of the ice sheet are as important as the oceanographic conditions. Hmm. That's great, Duncan. Go ahead. Yeah, following up on that point, do we have a sense of what was going on with the ice front uh, during those periods of the grounding line retreat? Well. Um, that's what we were hoping to get on the shelf where we would have been able to, where we would have, would have been able to, to hopefully see better, uh, where there were, um, um, ice shelves and ice tongues. Uh, you know, we've got, of course, fantastic seafloor imaging of, uh, uh, of, of past grounding positions. Um, but getting, a getting a, a stratigraphic record of how it might have changed over time is a lot more, a lot more difficult. Most of the sediment cores that have been recovered from the Amundsen Sea are are, are very short, um, and uh, either little little basins that are that are accumulating, uh, but we don't really have anything that gives us sort of the the whole glacial interglacial changes. Uh, that's why we wanted to bring the drill ship there, where we, where we could have gotten below some of the some of the, the late Pleistocene tills and, and see what was underneath them. Um, in the offshore area, we, we have a nice continuous record. We don't have any evidence of, of missing time, but it's more divorced from the ice itself, if that answered your question. Well, I guess the, uh, the, the other direction I'd take is on the Ross and Weddell side. Um, mm -hmm. When we retreat the grounding line there, the ice fronts of the Ross ice shelf and the, the Weddell ice shelf. Do we have mm -hmm. a sense on that? Um, well, you know, of course, the we've got again, we've got fantastic seafloor imaging in the Ross Sea. Um, and we've got uh, once you're once you're looking through the through the ice, you're you're more limited as to uh, as to what you can get in terms of radar and seismic and, and every other kind of uh, imaging. We were hoping with the wizard project to be able to to run this this uh, ROV with a with a uh, sub bottom profile or and, and, a, and a swath to get a, a better sense over the over the span again it would just be a span of of a uh, 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 two kilometer because we had a three kilometer cable so we would have been able to do surveys over a two kilometer you know postage stamp square but we would have had a better sense of of um, uh, whether there's you know much of migration of a grounding zone wedge there uh, we were never able to deploy that that tool, unfortunately. It's sitting in a warehouse in DeKalb. Um, uh, so it doesn't, I mean, we have these big grounding zone wedges out, out further out on the shelf. So we know sort of the maximum extent and times at which the ice grounding zone had, had uh, stalled enough time to, to, to build them. Uh, where the grounding line is right now on the Ross, on the Rossy side, as a small grounding zone wedge, not very big, nothing comparable to what we have out there. Um, so in terms of what the, what the historical migration of that is, 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 a, is a question that hopefully will be addressed by some of the new programs. We haven't really gotten to the, to, to the heart of those questions, I, I'm afraid. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't see any more hands up. I guess I could do another quick follow up. I'm just thinking about what's the proc, you know, okay, so the radiocarbon argues for fairly significant retreat, you know, within radiocarbon years, right? Um, do we, have we been able to attribute any observed distal records of, of sea level change associated with that? Or is it is it swamped by the other signatures, including the rebound and, and whatever else is? Well, I mean, remember, uh, sea level is 
is different everywhere in the world, but it's all integrating the same source. And so we're talking about pretty small changes. So it's it's hard to really pinpoint where the where the change was. Um, so how much was if you have a if you have a higher sea levels, how much of it was Antarctica, how much of it was was Greenland, and then of course you go back to uh, to uh, you know Laurentide ice sheet days, the the changes were were on a, on an even grander scale. Um, so it's so it's difficult to tie the the whole sea level question to a specific point source. Um, I don't know if that addressed your. Well, question I'm just curious if it was a large enough magnitude to show up in the global record or not. That that amount of pullback and. Um, and, and... But I would say show up yes, but define no. Okay. <laughs> part of the Got part it. of a bigger bigger signal. So it's it's really and it's the same it's the same with the isotope record and trying to trying to reconstruct ice sheets. Well, you can tell if they were giant ones, but you can you know given given the way insulation works, uh, where you can have high insulation in the north and 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 uh, low insulation in the south, you can have growth of West Antarctica and decay of Greenland at the same time, and they're canceling each other out completely in terms of both sea level and isotopes. So that's that's why we need to go and look where it actually is to 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 try and to try and nail these things down. And and uh, the the paper that I mentioned very very quickly that was doing a mixing model again, the radiocarbon was in in till. So like the same problem with the diatoms, nothing is in place. It's all mixed mixed and churned up. So it's very heavily dominated by by um, dead carbon. Most of the carbon is dead. But the fact that we had any at all, any radiocarbon at, at all, was just such a surprise. But it's very much diluted by all of this Miocene sediment and all this older stuff that's in there as well. So it's it's tricky. It's not it's not at all straightforward. And you can't use the radiocarbon as a dating mechanism because of the dilution is so high. All it is again is evidence of a event. So the only way you could get, I mean, those little fishies that I showed, you pull that grounding zone back and those little fishies would swim right in there. And then what do they do? They're going to die and they're going to leave their carbon behind and then it readvanced. So it doesn't, it wasn't, didn't need more than, um, you know, a thousand years or so of open water or a couple of thousand years to get enough carbon, which then gets mixed by the subsequent uh, readvance. Um, and so that was the nature of uh, of Sarah Newhouse's paper, looking at the at the the mixing model for for the radiocarbon and try to try to tie down what the what the ages are. Although we don't, you know, the, the we came back with a radiocarbon age, but they were we knew they were meaningless. The ages themselves were, you know, twenty two thousand years, eleven thousand, thirty thousand. That was garbage because it was because it was such a small component of the carbon in there. Um, but what it is telling you is that there was exposure to the open ocean subsequent to, um, wow, to you know, the current yeah. configuration. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, let's all thank, uh, thank Reed one more time um, for attending virtually, and maybe we can get you to Austin in person sometime. Yeah, I'd love, love, love to come. Love to share a beer with you and have a chat. And a couple of, couple of you I'll be speaking to later, later today, so thanks.